Well, good morning, and a warm welcome to Telecutri Baptist Church's morning service. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin, and I'm one of the elders here. We extend a very warm welcome to those present in the room, those joining us live on YouTube, and those who may be watching at a later time, and we pray that God would bless us all as we worship together. Our speaker today is our own Andy Walker, who will be looking at the second in our series of the I Am Statements of Jesus. I am the light of the world, from John chapter 8 and verse 12. I've just got a couple of things to highlight today. On a practical note, we are looking for a couple of additional volunteers to assist with setting up the church on Sunday mornings based on the Eventbrite bookings. If you can help with this, please speak to Frank or me. Please check the weekly email for the latest finance report and details of the elders' availability over the next couple of months. And last but not least, an update on our new pastor. The induction service for DGS will be held on Saturday the 14th of August, starting at 1400 hours, 2 o'clock. Martin Hodson, the General Director of the Baptist Union of Scotland, will be joining us, and this promises to be a joyous occasion please put this date in your diaries. We hope to serve some refreshments after the formal part of the service, subject to the regulations and guidelines that may be in force at that time. More details of the service and arrangements will be provided in due course. I also received this morning an email from Dee that I'd like to read out to you as it's addressed to you. Dee says... During my quiet time this morning, I was really inspired by Paul's letter of encouragement to the Corinthians, so I wrote this. Hello, Tilly family. I can't tell you how both excited and petrified I am of getting started next month. We as a family are truly honoured, grateful and massively encouraged that you, by God's grace, have chosen me to be your next pastor. May doing life together to the glory of Jesus bring not only numerical growth, but a deep and mature spiritual growth too. I know that the past couple of years have been challenging. However, it is clear to me that by his spirit, the Lord our God is in your midst. And you all have rallied together and served so faithfully up front and behind the scenes. We are proud to be a part of such a body of believers and look forward to many years of growing in the glory of the knowledge of Christ together. Grace and peace. And D finishes by quoting the verse from Zephaniah that he preached on earlier in June. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Thanks, Colin. Um, I'm just going to start off today's service with um, the verse that we're going to be, that Andy's going to be preaching on later on. Uh, it's John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, it's an amazing promise from God, and it's one that we've heard, heard probably quite a few times in our Walks with, walks with him and time in church, and I think, and we've got a God who's always there to help us, to support us and guide us, and all we need to do is receive his light and follow his teachings and the example set to us by Jesus. As we sing the first song, please take some time to consider how to connect with God and the different ways in which you see his light at work and in our lives and those around us. And I would need to remind you again, unfortunately, that we're still not allowed to sing. Um, but please feel free to clap, dance, hum, any of the things you're allowed to do. the world you 
in prayer we're going to pray for our community dear lord we thank you for this beautiful day thank you for our families we praise you lord among all that we have there are so many hurting and needy people in our families and wider community we lift them up to you and we ask that you would bless them help them and heal them may peace fill their hearts and your joy shine in their lives we also pray that you would use us, your people, to help them in any way we can. Open our eyes and make us aware of the opportunities we have to bless others in need. Help us not to be selfish. Help us to share. All that we have is yours and we surrender to you. Lord, we also pray for Andy as he's about to come up and preach your word and we thank you for all the preparation and time he has spent with you this week, getting ready for this time. Lord, we pray that you'll give us the ears to, to hear your message through his words today. Amen. Good morning, and it's uh, good to be back preaching once again. And uh, as has already been said, we are carrying on with our theme of the I Am Sayings of Jesus. Uh, Martin started us off brilliantly last week with uh, I Am the Bread of Life, and this morning we turn to I Am the Light of the World. 
Let's first have a look at the um, background to the passage, because um, I think that will probably help us in understanding it. So Jesus said these words in the temple towards the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, this was one of the three great feasts, um, and the Jews actually still celebrate this feast today. Um, and it was commissioned back in Leviticus 23. The feast begins on a Sabbath, and it carries on all week, and ends with a Sabbath day at the end. Um, and there would have been thousands of Jews from all over the place who had descended on Jerusalem to spend a week celebrating and remembering. So this was a celebration for harvest, but it was also a time when the Israelites remembered uh, God leading them out of Egypt and through the desert by his presence um, as they lived in tents and uh, the Lord provided for all their needs. Jesus, being a Jew, was in Jerusalem for the festival. And like everyone else, he'd have been staying in a tent. Um, again, is that reminder of the tents that they lived in as they wandered through the desert for 40 years. The feast also pointed to a time when God will once again tabernacle with them. As Christians, we joyfully celebrate um, that God's done that in the person of Jesus. John 1, 14 can be translated, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So that's a bit of background. That's where Jesus was, what was happening um, at that time. So let's just have a brief look at the context um, in which we're, Jesus' words were set. The passage just before this is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus is uh, again in the temple te teaching the crowds when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees come up to him with a woman in tow who had been caught in a tent with a man who wasn't her husband. Now, there was a man as well as the woman involved here, but the teachers of the law and the Pharisees just chose to bring the woman because they wanted to try and trip Jesus up. They told Jesus that the law states that this woman should be stoned to death and asks him what they should do. Instead of replying, Jesus simply kneels down and starts drawing on the ground with his finger. When they press him for an answer, he simply replied, let any of you who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he carried drawing on the ground. We don't know what he drew. We don't know what he wrote. There is various speculation, um, but we don't actually know. One by one, the accusers left. And Jesus asks the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? To which she replies, no one, sir. Now Jesus was sinless. He'd never sinned. He was God's son. He could condemn the woman. He could look down on her, wag her finger, give her a good telling off, or even cast the first stone. But he doesn't. He says, then neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. Isn't that some of the good news in a nutshell? Jesus could look down on each one of us point his finger, condemn us. But because Jesus is full of love and light, he doesn't condemn, he loves. John 3.16 says, as I'm sure you can all quote together, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish 
but have eternal life. The, a verse that the worldwide church knows and loves. John 3.17 says, anyone? Top marks, Alistair. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. A verse the worldwide church could learn from and ought to learn from and follow. Jesus doesn't condemn the woman caught in adultery because he wasn't sent to condemn the world. He was sent to love and save the world. In the verses after today's passage, we see Jesus encounter a man who was born blind. Jesus approached him, he spat on the ground, he made some mud and put it on the eyes of the man and then told him to wash it off in the pool of Siloam. When the man washed his eyes, he could see for the first time in his life. Today's passage is John 8, 12, and this is sandwiched in between those two stories. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. One of the important ceremonies that occurred during the Feast of Tabernacles was the illumination of the temple. This involved lighting four golden oil lamps in the court of the women. Now these lamps weren't tiny wee lamps. These lamps were 75 foot high menorahs and candelabras. And they were lit at night to remind the people of the pillar of fire that had led them through the desert on their wilderness journey. The light was so bright, it was said to have lit up, to illuminated the whole city. However, the light in this ceremony would only light up Jerusalem and would eventually be extinguished. But here, Jesus is saying that he is the eternal light of the whole world. Not just the light of Jerusalem, not just the light of the Jews, but the light of the world. The people who heard his words knew the promise of light was intrinsically linked to the messianic hope. And this would have been a really bold statement that would have far-reaching implications for them as it does for us. Jesus' light brings sight. It enables us to see what is around us. It, is a, it enables us to understand our surroundings. If we think about the story that comes after this passage of the man born blind, he would have lived his whole life only knowing darkness. But when Jesus opened his eyes, the light hit the back of his retinas for the first time and he could see. The light gave him a new lease of life. It allowed him to see his surroundings, his family, his own face. The light of Jesus shining on our lives brings revelation. It illuminates the dark corners of our lives, those bits of darkness we like to hide away, those bits we don't like to look at because it hurts. But his light casts out the darkness and brings life and hope without condemnation and, op and an opportunity to move on and become more like him. Jesus' light is also a moral light. It illuminates the deception and motives behind our actions. 
like the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus knew that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were trying to trip him up and make Jesus condemn himself. But the light of Jesus sees through this. And instead of, instead of the finger being pointed at Jesus, the finger turns to the accusers. And slowly, each one of them turns and leaves. Those accusers would also have seen the significance of Jesus using his finger to draw on the ground, as it had echoes of God's finger carving out the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone, and the fingers that appeared in King Belshazzar's palace and wrote on the wall. Jesus' light also brings direction. It is not enough to simply observe the light and gaze upon it, but we must follow it, believe in it, and walk in it, for it is light to our feet and not just our eyes. Jesus' light removes darkness from even the darkest places. When Jesus died, he took his light into the darkness of death, and in doing so, made even death a place that doesn't need to be dark. For those who live in Christ, there is sure and certain hope, both in this life and the next. Jesus' light is good news to a dark world. Jesus came to save the least, the last, and the lost. Not to bring condemnation, but hope and love. Earlier in John's Gospel, in chapter 1, verse 4, um, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light to all mankind. Light brings life. Without light, there is very little life. If the sun suddenly went out, the earth would soon seem to die, and the stuff on it would soon die off. Jesus brings us life, and life in all its fullness. Jesus' light also brings with it responsibilities for his followers. We're to reflect his light into the world around us. Yes, we all have our faults, and our mirrors get dirty and tarnished. But Jesus can make the dirtiest of mirrors clean. He can bring back our shine and sparkle, and enable us to reflect his light into the dark places around us. In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your sh light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's important to remember the context this was written in. Jesus isn't talking about plugging a nice LED lamp into the wall and flicking a switch. The lamp Jesus was talking about was probably an oil lamp. And I don't know if you've ever put an oil lamp or a candle even under a bowl but eventually it gets starved of oxygen and it goes out. Coming to church, viewing church online is a great thing, but being in a Christian bubble, never doing anything outside of church life isn't. I think the devil loves Sunday mornings because all our lights are under a bowl or slightly more accurately in a building. 
But if we stay here too long, if we never use our light, we might just be starved of oxygen. If we never give our light a sh chance to shine, then it's useless. Anthony, the other week, spoke about the most important bit of kit um, of the mountain rescue team being a torch. But if they never to take the torch out of their bag, if they never switch it on, then what's the point in having it? It can be the brightest torch in the world. But if it never shines to illuminate the darkness, then it will never help anyone. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus as a light to the world. Jesus so loved the world that he commissioned you and me to be his lights in the world. Not bringing judgment and condemnation, but light, love, hope, and leading people to the Savior whose light brings eternal life. I wonder where God might want you to shine his light this week. Just going to read some verses from uh, Romans 12. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, devel develops well-formed maturity in you. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in harder times, but pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Um, I love those verses from Romans 12. It gives us quite a, a very clear instruction. Um, and that was from the message version. Um, and I think it just enables us to see in a different light, the words, um, how we should live our lives. I'm going to close with a few lines that I saw online this week. Um, I'm not sure it 100% I'm not 100% convinced it hits, it fits with the theme. Um, but I saw these lines and uh, I thought it was really good. Um, so I'm going to close with it and uh, share it with you. When I say that I am a Christian, I am not shouting that I am clean living. I'm whispering, I'm lost, but now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not speaking of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need Christ to be my guide. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need his strength to carry on. 
when I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I failed. I need God to, to clean my mess. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I'm a Christian, I still feel, still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not holier than, than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's good grace somehow. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending your light into the world to illuminate darkness, to bring love, joy, peace, and hope. Thank you for choosing each of us to be illuminated by your light. Lord, be with us this week as we seek to shine your light in the dark places and situations in which we find ourselves. Help us to remember that you never leave us or forsake us. You love us and you want the best for us. You're always holding our hands in every situation. Be with us and guide us. Illuminate our way. Give us your words to say. And may we know your presence with us always. Amen. takes a bit more time to get ready at the moment.
sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. the promise your burning body began to be out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave as no grave on me Jesus yours is the victory there to carry us when we need carried. You're always there to, to lead us through the hardest times. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for that. Amen. As we finish off the service today, um, if we could speak through the blessing together. As it should be up on the screen there. And if we could encourage you to look around and bless each other as you're doing so. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. And that ends the official part of our service today. If people would like to stand around and chat, can we ask that you do so just outside and socially distanced? but we would encourage you to do so. Amen. Amen.